What's up everyone, Ben with the BTC Sessions here and this is your Daily Session. Huddle that Bitcoin. Before we dive into everything, of course, a big shout out to sponsors of the show, Ledin.io. This is where you can use your Bitcoin for a couple of different services, one of which is to obtain a Canadian or US dollar loan using your Bitcoin as collateral, and the second of which is a Bitcoin savings account where you can earn Bitcoin on your Bitcoin as interest. So you can check those down below at the link I provided. If you opt to get a loan, then they will give you an additional $50 worth of Bitcoin into your account using that link. And secondly, if you are into Bitcoin at all, and I imagine you are if you're watching this, then privacy is a big deal. Uh, one of the things that I use to help with privacy is NordVPN, and I use this on my phone and my computer. Uh, essentially, it helps uh, hide your IP address, it helps encrypt your browsing data, and it has the added benefit of allowing you to unlock geo-blocked content. So if you are interested in something like that, feel free to check out the link down below. You can get 75% off. It ends up being about three bucks a month if you use that deal. And with that, let's dive into the news. So Bitcoin price has dipped a little bit. We're sitting around 10 to 26. I'm not going to dive too much into price right now. Um, we were down below 10K a few days back and we kind of rebounded and went up to the high 10,000s and now seem to have rever reverted. So we seem to be bouncing between a range and it's really not too much to say about it until we get out of that range. So I guess we'll just have to tune in and see what happens. Uh, but there are a few interesting interesting things happening as of late. Uh, the first couple of stories actually have to do with um, the regulatory situation within the US and how certain com companies are dealing with that. So we're going to start with this one. So BACT is scheduled to start testing its Bitcoin futures contracts today on Monday. Um, and so what is BACT? Essentially, it allows people to speculate on the future price of Bitcoin, whether it's going to be high or low. Um, but the difference between this and many other offerings that are out there right now is it's actually settled in Bitcoin. So there are a couple other uh, op um, options out there, namely the one from the, the CME. Uh, from Chicago. And that one allows you to speculate on the future price of Bitcoin. But at the end of the day, when it's finally settled, it's settled in dollars, in cash, as opposed to actually requiring the entity to own and settle and uh, give Bitcoin to the people that are entitled to it. So a little bit of a different approach here. Now, backed is uh, they had already put this off a couple times. So originally they were looking at December 2018. They delayed it to January 2019 of this year. Uh, and then it just got kept on getting pushed. And here we are in July, July 22nd, and they're just starting their testing now. Um, a lot of this was just, again, regulatory uncertainty. Now, we have seen a couple other groups recently get approval to do the same thing that these guys are doing. Uh, Backed, I do not believe, has gotten that approval yet. So there is a little bit of a, a roundabout way of doing this. You can do something called self-certification if you haven't yet and got, uh, gotten approval from the CFTC. Essentially, this is just you verifying yourself, so backed, verifying themselves that they are compliant and just moving ahead with the product. And the only way that they could be stopped is if the CFTC reviewed their product and said you are not compliant for some reason. So it looks like they've just more or less gotten a little fed up with waiting and just said, listen, we're fine. We know we're fine. We've seen other people get approval. We're going ahead. You can check it out if you want to, but otherwise we're just going. Um, so that is an example of, again, the kind of slow regulatory process that takes place in the U.S. and, you know, many other um, countries and how these companies are just they're wanting to jump ahead. They're wanting to actually move on this. And it's just with the way that many things function in the U.S. regulatory uh, bodies it just doesn't work that way. And so companies are looking for solutions. And so this is one. Here's another. So Circle, uh, Circle Pay, they acquired Poloniex a while back. And well, guess what? They are moving 
all of their exchange operations completely offshore to Bermuda. And again, the reason for this is regulatory uncertainty in the US. So they've just gotten sick of waiting around. They can't do anything. They're moving everything offshore to Bermuda. And they've said that with this, um, they're able to offer a lot of things that they weren't able to offer to the US. And they will likely probably be uh, uh, offering a much more limited experience to any U.S. customers that remain on their platform. Um, so essentially, they, they've worked with the, the Bermuda government to kind of get this going. Um, and so to, to quote the article here, it says that they're, they're looking for more diverse assets that they would not normally be able to offer. Um, and essentially, they are also looking at yield generating crypto accounts. So what that means... It, it's up for speculation, but some people are saying perhaps, again, like an interest-based uh, savings account or perhaps even um, something where it has to do with staking coins and you can make money on your staked coins. I guess we will see. But uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty clear that US-based companies are just not having it anymore and they seem to be looking for alternatives either leaving or just going ahead and facing regulatory uncertainty anyways interesting um this next little piece here is actually just a summary of a video put together by Simon Dixon. I highly recommend you check it out. I'll link to that video down below. But essentially here, he outlined seven financial crisis triggers that could boost Bitcoin adoption, drive people to Bitcoin over time. Um, and he goes through a series of things here. So we'll just kind of poke at a couple of them. So some of the uh, the triggers that he cites as a potential meltdown um, are government debt, of course. I mean, the national debt clock is insane. Um, the stock market being propped up by said debt is another trigger that could set it off. Um, there's a global movement towards discouraging saving and even um, having neg negative interest rates in many companies. So that means essentially you put your money in the bank to save and instead Instead of earning interest on it, they're taking a little bit of it every month, uh, which blows my mind again. Um, uh, it's also there's, uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. yeah, insolvent pensions. So again, pension funds tend to be a little bit pyramidy, <laughs> um, and it, it, there's just not the money to support uh, the extended uh, lifespans of many people nowadays and the the growing population. And you, you have a population that is just not being supported. It's very, very difficult to do the math and think of, well, if I put away a few percent of my paycheck every day for 30 years, am I going to be able to live off that for a further 30 years? It just does not add up. Um, Again, he cites an overdependence on student loans and these students having gone sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt only to go into a field where there are no jobs available. Um, credit card debt on the rise. Um, and again, an overdependence on real estate, which was the cause of the 2008 uh, recession. So uh, a number of things. He does go much further into detail with them, but I found it to be a very interesting video. Um, now, the one issue I do have with it is we've seen in the past with financial crises that by the time you need Bitcoin, it's kind of too late to get Bitcoin. So I think in, in a roundabout way, it could eventually lead to people cluing into the value of something like Bitcoin. Um, but it's going to take them getting hurt in order to realize it. So, you know, in Cyprus during the, the banking, the Cypriot banking crisis, people didn't realize they needed Bitcoin until it was too late, until their, their savings were, were completely gone. Same with in Greece, when there was the Greece banking crisis and people could only take out 40 euros a day. Well, 
at that point, you literally need all of the money that you can get out of the bank that day just to survive, just to get your food and and pay whatever expenses you have to pay. Um, And so there's no option to be moving money into Bitcoin. It's already too late. But what it can do is it can trigger people that maybe aren't directly affected by those crises to say, well, I better hedge my bets and have something that is unconfiscatable, that is ready as a, a, you know, to prevent myself being totally screwed should something like this happen to me. So interesting. Again, links for that down below. Last thing I wanted to touch on here is, again, kind of a silly article because it's based on a couple tweets, but um, Savedine, uh, author of the Bitcoin Standard, he was replying to a tweet. Um, He, uh, somebody said, who was it? Uh, Blockstack CEO. uh, He said that uh, you can be long on Bitcoin and support other innovations in crypto. Crypto is not a zero sum game. Now, Savedine did come back and say that uh, he, he essentially said that any um, investor who is not holding Bitcoin has already lost the battle and uh, cryptocurrency is indeed a zero sum game. If you're not in Bitcoin, you've already lost. Um, so not everybody agreed with him. Obviously, you have uh, Shapeshift CEO Eric Voorhees chipping in. He said, this is just not true. One chain cannot optimize for all variables and all desired attributes of a digital asset. Thus, multiple will exist. And further, while uh, uh, while in part competitive, they are also in part complementary and constructive. Only BTC is a weaker landscape. So when I look at stuff like this, I... In the short term, I guess I get it. I'm, people are impatient. They want to do what they want to do now. So when it comes to something like privacy, you can get a degree of privacy using Bitcoin um, if you go through things like like CoinJoin or like Whirlpool and you pay attention to a lot of stuff like utilizing Tor and utilizing a VPN and uh, things like that where you have to be quite careful and you have to be conscious of it regularly. Um, However, I could see that being a bit of a daunting task to somebody and maybe they just want to utilize a coin that just has privacy baked right in. Now, do I think it's going to get easier with Bitcoin? Absolutely. Things always do. It's more of a patience thing. Uh, The same thing could have been said a couple years back with cheaper payments. When shit hit the fan at the end of 2017 and everything was skyrocketing and people were not utilizing the Bitcoin blockchain in a an efficient manner. They weren't batching transactions. They weren't using SegWit. By and large, anyway, some companies were very proactive on that, but others were not. And because of that, blocks were super full, fees had skyrocketed to, you know, all-time highs. And And people were saying, well, Bitcoin can clearly never be used for payments. Fast forward, even in times of absolute, you know, full blocks where a lot of people are trying to get through, you, you see that the fees are nowhere near the levels that they were back in the peak at 2017. Uh, furthermore, we have options now. We have Lightning Network. We have multiple uh, mobile wallets for Lightning. You have solutions that are custodian, non-custodial, and somewhere in between. You have a lot of options popping up on the market. And so I do kind of see this as, you know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that Bitcoin is what matters and that's where the innovation lies. And I do think that the innovations that people demand will be implemented on Bitcoin. However, I do see that people are impatient. Again, it's, it's kind of that time preference, um, you know, that, that high time preference that some people have where they need it now. Um, And I don't think that's a bad thing when it comes to driving innovation. Sure, go experiment, create things. But I think in the long run, regardless, you're going to have this kind of base layer of value atop which different protocols are built for different purposes. And I do think it will kind of coalesce all on that one asset. Not saying that there won't always be alternatives Absolutely. I mean, we've seen that there's totally useless coins that so I mean, there's a lot of totally useless coins that still exist out there that people still play with. But I do think that by and large, Bitcoin will be the base layer for value on the Internet and there will be fringe use cases for some other stuff. But that will not be where people place their money for long term value. 
Anyways, let me know what you think about that. Um, I always find it interesting, these types of arguments, because again, I do sympathize that people want to play with things, uh, but I just don't see the long-term value in it. And that's kind of why I'm here, is replacing money, replacing sound money and getting a second crack at a gold standard for the, the planet. So anyways, uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you guys very much for watching. Of course, if you're new here, hit like, subscribe and share. If you want to help out the show in another way, hit up either of my sponsors, Ledin or NordVPN, links for that down below. And if you really liked what you saw, you can drop me a tip via the Lightning Network at my tippin.me page. With that, I am out. I will see you guys tomorrow for your daily session.